Auspicious greeting, everyone. Welcome to our Future and Hope public lecture series, organized by Foguangsan Buddhist Temple Boston. My name is Sujen, and I am the MC for today's event. On behalf of BRIA Boston, I would like to welcome our speaker, Venerable Miao Guang. We are delighted and it's our honor to host you today, Venerable Miao Guang. Venerable Miao Guang is currently the director of Fo Guang Dictionary of Buddhism English Translation Project and deputy chancellor of Fo Guang San Institute of Humanistic Buddhism. Before we begin, I would like to invite the director of our Fo Guang San Buddhist Temple Boston, Venerable Jue Qian, to begin our session. I will now pass the session to Venerable Jue Qian. Please, Venerable Jue Qian. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Auspicious greetings to Venerable Miao Guang and everyone online. Tonight, we are very happy to have Venerable Miao Guang with us to share her wisdom. For the past few years, Venerable Miao Guang and I have been working together to promote localization of Buddhism. We have been working, she has been working very hard to compile numerous English resources for us to promote humanistic Buddhism in the Western country. I still remember she once says to me, I will be supporting all of you behind, providing bullets to you to fight in the battlefield. Localization of Buddhism in the Western country is a very long journey. However, when she said this sentence, I know that we are not alone. We have a team with a lot of team members spreading around the world, trying our best to spread the seeds of humanistic Buddhism. And most important is that we have someone in headquarters that fully support us in all around the world. So tonight, I invited Verbal Miao Guang to our BRIA Public Doc to share her passion and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Jue Qian. Moving right along, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Venerable Miao Guang. The Dharma talk will last about an hour, followed by a 30 minutes Q&A session. I would like to welcome you to ask questions by typing your question, either using the Q&A feature on Zoom or on YouTube. Please join me in welcoming well, uh, Venerable Miao Guang, uh, whose title of the talk is Hot Sutra on a Practical Perspective. Please, Venerable Miao Guang. Good evening to our Dharma friends in Boston and North America. And good morning to our friends in Asia, if you're joining from other parts of the world. And good day to those who I may not be able to address in the proper, according to the proper time zone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Venerable Jue Qian and our friends from Blair Boston for this opportunity to connect with you though not in person, but in heart and in spirit in a very special time. This is a very special year. We are going through much ups and downs because of COVID-19. Um, but this has indeed been a wonderful year of reflection for us to really look at what's happening to us. And so tonight I've chosen the topic of Heart Sutra on a practical perspective to perhaps assist those who have been chanting the Heart Sutra for many, many long years, um, but never probably had a chance to come in heart uh, to connect with this very concise but profound short text. Okay. As has been said, Many of us have been in lockdown for the past half year, so to speak. And what have you been experiencing when you have been in the condition of sheltering place where you can't go out anywhere? Right? It probably has driven a lot of people nuts for having, deprived, having been deprived of the freedom to really go anywhere you want to get some fresh air. But there is a saying among Buddhists, when you can't go out, always go in, right? 
We see this as an amazing opportunity for you to explore your inner world without the distractions or the temptations of the physical world. But certainly when we explore this inner world, we will need very clear and precise guidelines to how we should practice and cultivate as Buddhists. So what I'll do today is when I talk about the Heart Sutra, uh, I'm not going to go through the theoretical parts because I've already covered this in my Dharma talk on the Fo Guangshan English Dharma Services YouTube channel um, on the three levels of Shunyata. So um, if you want to go back and revise on the theories, uh, whenever you, you can, uh, just search for Guangshan English Dharma Services on YouTube or Blogger. We will have a 35 minute talk on um, a walkthrough of the Heart Sutra. But what I'll do today is actually to answer a few questions that you may have when you are locked down at home, sheltered in place, thinking about, okay, now this is a moment when I need to think about how Dharma becomes applicable. So I will do this uh, by answering a few questions I have designed in order to help us uh, discover the practical aspect of this profound theoretical guide uh, of a Buddhist text. Okay, so first of all, um, we might ask, why do we always talk about the Heart Sutra? Right. especially among Chinese Buddhists. Why is it so popular? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's popular. I like it. You find it helpful because it's short and concise. It only consists of 260 Chinese characters and probably 75% lesser the word count when you refer to an English version. And so it's popular because the Heart Sutra fits the modern day mind where we no longer like to read long text. We just don't have the patience and we don't have the time. So that is why people refer to Twitter, right? No more than 150 bytes to get an idea. Or young people now refer to TikTok because you only get about 30 seconds of videos that doesn't distract you too much, but entertains you enough. Or you use Snapchat, where you only send forth 30 videos, 30 seconds of videos again to your friends to complete the message that you want to deliver. So you might imagine this is like a Snapchat or Twitter version of the profound Buddhist teaching, right? Buddha says, okay, every day you go back to revise it. Uh, there's not too much load on it. You just re you know recite the sutra and eventually the meaning will come to you. So it's popular for this first reason. And the second reason to why I think the Heart Sutra is popular among practitioners of Chinese Buddhism or the Pranayaparamita tradition is that it's easy to chant and pleasant to hear. In many of the Dharma services that go on at Fo Guangshan, you will discover be, be it a baby blessing or a wedding, right? Or a memorial service or a funeral procession or long or short Dharma services. Almost always you hear the Heart Sutra and almost always everybody can follow the chant effortlessly because the translation is so fluent and when you hear it, it somehow calms your mind. And so in fact, when many Buddhist masters translated Buddhist text, um, there is actually a hidden final procedure to their translation procedure, which is after having clarified the meaning, completed the translation and matched the definition and accuracy of both versions, the last step to a translation court is actually to chant the translation. And they want to do this because they want to make sure that what has been translated is actually fluent and pleasant to the ear so that it's easy for us to remember. Okay. I might also let you know that the fastest way for us to internalize the Dharma is to always hear it. By keep hearing it, you turn your sharpest faculty towards the messages of Dharma, which are your ears. So as you chant this, it becomes a continuous affirmation of what you were reading. An affirmation that this is the truth, 
an affirmation that once you internalize it, it's going to make sense. It's going to make a difference in you. And thirdly, we would say the Heart Sutra is popular because you are looking at deep and profound wisdom in a nutshell, right? Uh, we talk about uh, not, uh, books for dummies, right? You talk about Buddhism for dummies, physics for dummies, but this is not for dummies. We talk, we're talking about a very concise survival kit for anyone who want to learn even the basic knowledge because we almost guarantee that whatever text you come across in the future, it will overlap with the teachings of the Heart Sutra on the sense of emptiness, on the teachings of no self, and finally on the teaching of liberation. And so the fourth pot reason um, to why it's so popular as has been said before is that it's a very common procedure that we chant every day. So next time somebody asks you, hey, you're a Buddhist, right? Can you do a blessing for me? I feel very distraught right now. If you don't know what procedure you can follow, chant the Heart Sutra, right? You chant the Heart Sutra, so you establish this heart-to-heart -heart connection with your friend or your colleague. And in the future, you would have already planted the seed for them to really realize the profound teaching. And number five, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Xuanzang, the greatest translator of the Heart Sutra, um, one who really came up with the most popular and widely circulated edition of the Heart Sutra. In the fact that when he traveled west, uh, coming through the desert, it has been a very dangerous uh, journey. But chanting the Heart Sutra was actually what kept him through, what kept him strong, what kept him resilient. So there were moments when he was lost in the desert and when he picked up his final bit of water in his pack, he accident accidentally dropped that sack. So thinking in that moment of despair, he decided to chant to Avalokiteshvara and said, Dear Bodhisattva, my goal of traveling westward is not for my own fame or gain. I have only, only one go, goal in doing so, that is, for the purpose of discovering the Dharma that can help endless beings attain liberation. If you have no doubt in my, in my vow, help me get through this. And at that moment, the sandstorm ceased and he felt this very refreshing energy surge through his body and his horse. And the two of them were able to get up from the fatigue and constant hunger and then discover the nearest oasis that provided water. And so this is a very special story about Avalokiteshvara and Xuanzang, where you see that apparently Avalokiteshvara passed this message to Xuanzang and said, okay, chant the Heart Sutra whenever you're in danger from now on, and I'll be waiting for you in your destination. So when he finally arrived in Nalanda, there was a teacher waiting for him already who says, oh, okay, Avalokiteshvara told me that someone great from China is going to come and I've been told to teach you everything I know. And that message that was sent to the teacher, Silabhadra, was also Avalokiteshvara. And so we will see that everybody loves a legend. Everybody loves a legend that creates this immense influence to, any, to all of us who follow the teaching afterwards. So Xuanzang's encounter with Avalokiteshvara has become a wonderful legend that keeps our faith in the Heart Sutra strong. And so again, when you're lost, when you are fearful, think about Avalokiteshvara as one who will give you fearlessness. It takes away your fear, gives you confidence, and guides you towards wisdom to help you resolve the issues. And the sixth and seventh reason is that the Heart Sutra contains the teaching of true reality. It helps us see who we really are. It helps us see who, what reality really is. It also helps us realize what we do with that knowledge, right? The emptiness of the self doesn't mean that nothing is there. In fact, understanding that emptiness of the self and phenomena somehow keeps us even closer to all living beings in this world. There's that great wise and compassionate intimacy which the Heart Sutra helps us establish. And if you realize that, 
it becomes a compass that takes you home, to the home of your heart, to the home where your Buddha is, to the home where liberation lies. And the next question is, why is it so difficult to understand the Heart Sutra? So for many people, when I come to this stage, you might think, okay, I've been chanting the Heart Sutra for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Okay, so, so what is the reason behind my not being able to understand what the Sutra wants to tell me? What, it, what I can actually do with that knowledge? Okay. Um, let, allow me to explain this with a story. Okay. Having been translated into Chinese, okay, um, not, it's not just the Heart Sutra, but what comes from the Pranayaparamita family is also the Diamond Sutra. So there's this that legend about Emperor Wu of Liang, Liang Wudi, who discovered there's this great Mahasava, okay, um, a great practitioner named Fu, Fu Da Shi, who has attained the highest or the perfection of wisdom. So he says, okay, I now order you to teach the Diamond Sutra. Okay. And so what Fu Da Shi or Master Fu did was he passively agreed to this when he ascended the throne or the seat to teach the Dharma of the Diamond Sutra or the ultimate wisdom of emptiness, instead of expounding on the meaning, he picks up this slab, wooden slab on the table, slams it against the table, walks off. And then that was his whole teaching. Okay leaving everybody dumbfounded as to what exactly did he want to say. And so Buddhist masters of later age um, give an annotation to this situation with the verse, okay? which basically means that that which is the wondrous spring mountain top cannot be expressed with words. Okay? Only from the second highest peak is the slightest space allowed for language to meet with it. And in other words, when you try to teach the idea of emptiness, right? You want to talk about something that is not there. So how do you actually express an idea that is invisible or very hard to grasp? What Fu Da Shi wanted to do is similar to uh, the, the founding by George Berkeley, a bishop, a scientist, a psychologist, and a philosopher from the 18th century who had this wonderful discovery that became perhaps the earliest encounter with this profound teaching of Shinyata in Buddhism. So in his encounter, he, he asked the question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? So what do you think? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't make a sound. Why? As a physicist himself, he had discovered that in order for sound to be established, it needs some kind of media or space for it to travel. In other words, sound is not a solid thing. Sound is wave. Right, the traveling of wave through space. And when this vibration of wave, air coming through space, is captured by your eardrums, then there is a sound. So this is similar to James Clerk Maxwell's idea or discovery of the fact that there's really no sound. At his ceremony of reception for, of the Nobel Prize for Physics, he says, I want to tell you one thing. There's no color. When we talk about red or blue, right? We're not talking about real things because color is the mere reflection of wave. So the same goes to sound. Sound needs to move through space before it can be heard. And so if a tree falls in the forest, but your eardrums are not there, then the conditions for the sound to be heard does not establish. And therefore, why did Fu Da Shi simply just slam the wooden block? He wants to tell you the same thing. 
There's really no form, no sound, no taste, no touch, no smell. What you are experiencing are temporarily impermanent moments of personal experience that will not stay. And any moment you treat them as real, you fall into the trap of delusion. Okay. So I want to use this opening to talk about why prana paramita is difficult to understand because it has never meant to be a concept for you to understand. When we encounter prana paramita, we are talking about the truth. And the only way to understand the truth is to actually experience it. So from this point onwards of my talk, I would like you to keep this in mind and remember that whatever about the, uh, the, about the Heart Sutra that we speak of, we are finding ways to really combine it with our personal experience on our path to liberation. And so having said this, right, George Berkeley's experience reflecting with the Nobel Peace Prize winner in physics. Okay? We want to come back to, as we speak of the Heart Sutra, what is at the heart of? Okay? Today, I would like you to see the Heart Sutra as the heart of two things, not of theory, not of understanding, but first of all, the Heart Sutra presents itself as the heart of all Buddhist cultivation. When Avalokiteshvara opens with that he, when he was coursing deep in the Pranayaparamita, right, he saw that the five skandhas are empty and thus overcame all ills and suffering. Okay. So in this part, we see that the Heart Sutra is really about an action that has been taken. First, the realization. Second, the attainment of the goal. We all cultivate ourselves to attain or achieve this exact same goal. So this is the heart, the first heart we want to look at today. And second of all, it is the heart of Buddhist practice. Okay. Cultivation means that we grow and create the necessary criteria for us to attain liberation or to find our way to the other shore. And practice means that even when we arrive at the other shore, we realize that it does not stop. It requires us to continuously apply our wisdom and compassion gained from this experience without realizing or thinking that there are such theories or practices. Okay. And I'll explain this later. Okay, but allow me to begin with this idea of the goal, right? the heart of cultivation of practice in order for us to achieve the goal. So when we say, okay, we have the heart of two things, cultivation and practice, okay? we do, we cultivate and practice, practice to arrive at some kind of de destination. We must make sure that everything we do everything we strive to achieve has a proper purpose. Therefore, the Heart Sutra or the Pranya Paramita Hridaya Sutra shares that goal. And it's actually a very clear one. When it talks about the Pranya Paramita, right? Paramita basically means the goal, right? The goal of the other shore of, uh, of ignorance. But sometimes we fail to see the two aspects of Paramita. First of all, the Sanskrit word of parami means to perfect, to perfect. And the ta is actually the suffix to make it a noun. And so that's why paramita becomes perfection, right? It's an action of perfecting our experiences and how we respond to this. And there another aspect of paramita is when we break paramita into param, a mita, where param now becomes to arrive at the other shore, while ita means its past participle, which means paramita becomes having arrived at the other shore. 
Okay, so setting a goal. So par the perfection means a means to how we achieve that goal, while parameter means the completion of that goal. And what is that goal exactly? Right? People ask, what does the other shore look like? What is the perfected self? In the Heart Sutra, right, the main heroine, the protagonist, who, who is Avalokiteshvara, gives us an answer in his own name. When we say Ava Lokita Ishvara means to look from high above as the Lord who observes. This word Ishvara becomes the goal that paramitas. And so what we want to do and learn from the Heart Sutra means our goal to really find the Zizai or the Ishvara. So what is the state of being in Ishvara or Zizai? The Sanskrit word of Ishvara basically means Lord, which means you're in control, right? You, you rule it, you rule the world. And so how do you become the ruler of your own mind or self? That is a question. And, but the second meaning which we have come up with recently when we talk about zizai, is this very interesting word, self-mastery. Okay. Zizai does not mean perfect ease. Okay. Zizai means to help self-mastery of who you really are. So it is the ability to recognize, to understand, to control, and to make the most of your physical, mental, and emotional self without distracted by external circumstances. Okay. This is how we attain Ishvara. Okay. And so now we have the basic connection with, um, to the Heart Sutra. And we have established the fact that the Heart Sutra or the Parana Paramita is not a concept to understand, but more so a practice or an action to be taken. And for the goal of really finding that self-mastery. So how do we go about doing it? Okay, I have about half an hour more. So let's talk about a few methods to finding that goal of Ishvara. Okay. We now look at the opening line. Okay, so say, where basically the Heart Sutra go, goes, Sariputra asks Avalokiteshvara, how should we cultivate in order to attain Pranayaparamita? So in answering this question, Avalokiteshvara, in that very laid back position, the position of Ishvara, it says, okay, you know, the moment when I find myself immersed deeply in Pranayaparamita is first of all, when I first realize that the five skandhas are empty in nature. And by doing so, I overcome all ills and suffering. This is a very crucial line in the, entire, the entirety of Heart Sutra. And perhaps the most important practical aspect we need to master before we overcome all, we, all ills and suffering to attain paramita. Okay, so how do we do this? Okay, in short, the five skandhas consist of form, right? The physical shapes, colors that we see through our sensory organs. Right? We see, we feel, we smell, we taste and touch the external world. And what happens is, based on what we see, feel and touch, we have sensations. For example, if you put a scoop of ice cream into your mouth, right? the feeling will be icy, cold, uh, sweet, right? or unfortunately, if it, if it is wasabi ice cream, right? the sensation will be spicy and unpleasant. And thirdly, perception comes in the fact that you start to label these experiences as good or bad. And you cling on to that good or bad as a decisive factor to how you will re react to a similar experience in the future. And what happens is the next time you encounter a similar form right, or incident, your mental forces will make a decision on your behalf for you to decide what actions you'll take, what words you will say, in order to repeat the moment when you want to attain, fulfill your desire of happiness or joy. And this whole process becomes stored in your consciousness like a hard drive. So the next time similar sets of data appears before your eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, 
you draw out your past experiences where it sends forth signals to tell you, okay, this time, last time, this is how you act, reacted in order to make yourself happy. So you should do the same. Okay. And so together we call the five skandhas, the five aspects of human experiences. And now the Bodhisattva says, okay, you have to see that these are empty. Okay. So how do you see these five skandhas as empty? First of all, we want to clarify the definition of shunyata or emptiness by realizing that when we say that it's empty, it doesn't mean that it's not there. By emptiness, it merely tells us that these five aspects of human experience, first of all, are not always the same. They will not stay eternally the same this way. And secondly, these are mere coming togethers of different conditions. So it has no absolute true self aspect. So the idea is that when we realize that these are empty, right? We understand that there's no need to grasp it because when you try to grab air, you can't grab anything. So these experiences in the same way are like the air that you cannot hold on to. And any moment you try to fulfill that desire to hold on to something that doesn't exist, dukkha therefore arises. And so in order to, to overcome this dukkha, bear in mind that by emptiness, they're not real. They don't have a true unchanging eternal self. Okay. And so that being said, I don't want to cover the theoret theoretical aspect again. Um, Let's begin with how we overcome the dukkha caused by form. Okay. So as said before, form is the physical shapes or colors that we see. But in this case, on the practical aspect, okay, today let's refer to form as a physical body. This physical form that takes action, that has thoughts, that continue to give rise to consequences that somehow makes us suffer. But I want to ask, have we ever realized what is the cause of our own suffering? In many cases, we allow our mind, body, and speech to take action without realizing that what appears to be joy and satisfaction on the surface are actually deep down causing dukkha. We are actually our own cause. This is what us ordinary beings do. Most of our time, we allow this physical body to take actions that cause more to come than suffering. But the question is, is this how the Buddha treated his physical body in his previous lives? Did the Buddha use his physical body to only cause to come? The answer is no. Okay. We see examples of his previous lives as King Shibi, who in the process of trying to save the life of a pigeon that was being chased down by an eagle. He was willing to actually cut off his flesh to match the weight of the pigeon. And the eagle was actually an Indra or a heavenly being who wanted to test the resolve of King, of King Shibi's kindness and compassion to benefit all beings. Therefore, he also conjured up this pigeon that he was chasing after. The pigeon seeks shelter underneath King Shibi's legs. And when the eagle comes, right, King Shibi tells the eagle, hey, be kind, right? Don't take away the pigeon's life. But the eagle says, I'm, a, I'm alive too. I need to feed in order to survive. So how can you in the process of saving one life, hurt the other. Therefore, King Shibi says, okay, how about this? What if I offer the same amount of flesh for my body that equals that of the pigeon? So you can still be well fed and the pigeon's life is saved. The eagle agreed only with a trick. Okay. He pulled a magic on the scale. Right? For the, for the king to realize no matter how much of his flesh he cuts off and puts on the scale, it's never enough. 
And so in the end, King Shibi threw his own body, whole body onto the scale. He says, okay, take my whole body, my whole life, so that I may save both of you. And in this case, we see that the Buddha in his past life overcame the restrictions of his body in order to achieve his vow of kindness and compassion. He was never attached to it. But for us, it's quite different, right? Um, our interest is always first to satisfy the desires of this physical body, usually at the cost of other living beings and lives. But King Shibi, who was the previous lives of the Buddha, did exactly the opposite. And Upali himself, as one of the slaves who was born in the lower caste in the Indian caste system, he used his physical body to focus on serving the Buddha. So as a barber, when he helped the Buddha shave his head, right, the Buddha gave him a few instructions, such as, okay, straighten your body, relax your hand, focus on what you're doing. Right? And so by following the rules given by the Buddha, Upali was able to attain enlightenment with what he was doing. And so having seen this, we must realize that although the physical form cannot be separated from our understanding of shunyata, what we have to try is to make sure that we are making the best of this physical form without putting labels onto the body. For example, in Fo Guang Shan, when Fo Guang Shan became more and more complete, with the three hilltops of the Buddha Museum, as well as the Sutra Repository. We see that the elder visitors find it harder and harder to walk through this vast space. And so we began to recruit volunteers to come and drive these buggies to help visitors travel around this large covering of land at Fo Guang Shan. But when you see these volunteers, we were quite surprised to see the men who had come to sign up for this volunteer work of doing the simple driving actually turned out to be retired CEOs of large businesses enterprises. And so these CEOs were able to relinquish their title, forget about who they used to be and only focus on the present moment of offering service. So this is how they see that their form is actually empty. And so how do we remedy dukkha caused by form? From the example of Upali, we cultivate the causes and conditions for liberation by following precepts. Only when you discipline your mental, verbal, and physical deeds are you able to find your way to liberation. Okay, so in other words, do what is right with the conventional body to realize the ultimate truth. And how do you make sure you're doing what is right? The presets become a wonderful guideline for you to follow to make sure that the best outcome will come from your deeds. Okay. So this is the first way for us to help us see that the five skandhas are empty, that form is empty. Okay, next how do we see that our feelings or sensation are, are, are empty? So as said before, having encountered the physical world, we tend to give rise to feelings of good or bad. And the problem is when we see the feelings of good and bad, right? we tend not to be able to be free from it. We tend to be led in the nose by these feelings. So to remedy dukkha caused by our first feelings, first of all, how do we practice in order to rise above them? Okay. The key is meditative concentration. And by meditative concentration, it means a one-pointed focus on the reality. So a one-pointed focus on the reality that is telling us what we experience is not real, right? It's momentary, it will change. So try hold on to something that is not real, something that is momentary, and something that will eventually change. Okay. We all know this, 
But what if I now tell you to not hold on to your joy? Do you think it's easy? What happens is in this process, the practice of, of meditative concentration that requires us to continue to think about how our sensory organs should respond accordingly to the external objects based on the teachings of Shunyata. What it's telling us is that, okay, we need to balance out the sensations that are coming through. They're neither too good, neither too bad. Okay? Because something that is good is not definitely good. In the past, you would have wished for longer weekends so you get to stay at home. Suddenly this year, you're being asked to stay at home every day. So we got to ask, has the result of having to stay at home every day made you happier? Has it actually satisfied your desire to be free and to, to, to relax at home? This is a moment when you realize too much joy no longer is joy. Too much joy becomes suffering. Another example is when we try to satisfy our joy by eating chocolate, right? It has been said that when you eat chocolate, it helps your brain secrete a substance that offers a sense of joy and happiness. So that's why we all love chocolate. But chocolate is no longer a joy when you visit a restaurant that is called Death by Chocolate. I came across this restaurant in Sydney. Death by chocolate means when you go in there, everything they serve is large portions of sugar and cocoa. Okay. And you discover that everybody walks into that restaurant with a smile, but they always walk out, walk out with this very painful expression from having eaten too much chocolate. Okay. Where that sweet and pleasant sensation becomes a sickening, sense of too much sugar. And so any, any moment we try to satisfy our desire for joy, you will discover that if you overshoot, when you do too much of it, it's really not joy. And so is suffering really suffering? Is joy really joy? We have to ask you that. Okay. To empty out the dukkha caused by the sensations, all we need to do is ask ourselves this question. Okay. Because feelings of joy is not unchanging and eternal. But at the same time, the way we empty out suffering is the same. Okay. What we do is when we go into the gym to train our muscles, at first it's going to be painful because of the amino acid. But we, we discover that by balancing out our emotion towards suffering, that is not something bad. We find our way to coexist. It. Eventually you discover that it becomes easier and easier to do the weight training. So suffering in life too can be compared to that weight training. When we eventually find a way to coexist it, with it, it doesn't have this strong influence on us anymore. Okay. And so as we look at this external world and when we feel everything, what we need to do is remember to attach to nothing while realizing that we are connected to everything. We are a part of the whole, but we don't have to be led in the nose by it. Okay. Now, thirdly, how do we empty perception? Okay. Perception means volition or thoughts that arise, which will help you make a decision of what these labels are. Okay. The, the labels of pleasant or unpleasant feelings, the labels of good or bad. Okay. And so in this process, what the arhat does is we remedy um, perception by the practice of wisdom. Okay. So the practice of wisdom actually helps us make a proper decision to what we're seeing. Okay. So just a few days ago, uh, Madam Ina Denton from Orlando sent me a picture. She says, oh, I had such a good laugh when I saw this recipe. Okay. I took a look at it. Look at it. And I said, oh, I never realized dukkha is a type of food. And then from that moment on, whenever I thought about this recipe of roasted carrots with dukkha, all I could think about is the moment you eat it, you will experience nothing but pain. Okay. 
And but after much research, uh, Venerable Zhiyue from um, Fo Guangshan headquarters tells me, oh, Dukkha and Dukkha are two different things, right? When you place the H in a different place, right? We realize this Dukkha we're looking at is only some type of Egyptian spice blend of nuts and other ingredients that gives you nutrients and energy. And so what happens is without prana wisdom, we get caught in concepts that locks us in some kind of a beast. And then we can't get out of the frame. So anything you think is actually set within that frame. So how do you get yourself outside of Dukkha? To break free from the restrictions of these concepts and to realize that in reality, there's really no such thing as Dukkha. And there's no food called Dukkha. It's only a blend of spices and nuts. Right? So either way, no matter where you put the H, there's no Dukkha. Therefore, to remedy our perception, Pranya wisdom or the insight into reality of the fact that, okay, whatever it is that you establish, right, is not real, helps us become detached to our established mentality. Okay, so um, this is the picture of the recipe, right? You see roasted carrots with dukkha, right? You have one teaspoon of this, one tablespoon of that, you create this but it's really not the kind of dukkha we're thinking about. And so seeing reality as it is, or seeing reality as it should be, takes on your wisdom to do so. And then fourthly, how do we empty out our attachment to mental forces? By mental force, it means after the previous three experiences, we apply a force to our action, to our speech, in order to make a change. But in this particular change, when Bodhisattva says, you see they're empty, so you overcome all ills and suffering, you want to make sure that you take actions to find liberation. Okay, sitting there thinking it won't help. And so having established that precept, meditative concentration and wisdom are ways to help us train our mind against the restrictions created by form, feelings and perception, now, upon the stage of mental force, this is where you see you take actual action to liberate yourself. And by liberation, it actually means to be free from something. So you would imagine um, in early Buddhist practices, when the arhats cultivate their mind in order to liberate themselves uh, from suffering, what they do is in every moment of contemplation and experience, they remind themselves of the need to stay free from thoughts of greed, anger, or ignorance. And so any moment you break free from these three poisons, liberation arises. And therefore the point comes in, okay? How do you make the best of your actions? How do you enjoy every moment by applying the proper mental forces to always think on the bright side. Okay, so for example, I'm at home, right? Although I can't go out, if you keep thinking that I can't go out, then afflictions arise. You get angry, you get dissatisfied. You start to think of all these fantasies. But in this moment, when you come back to applying the proper mental forces, that is right mindfulness, you ask yourself, okay, what are the good things I can get out of the situation? First of all, I'm at home, I'm safe, I'm well protected. Second of all, when I'm at home, I get to do the things that I have long wanted to do. I get to spend time with myself. And but finally, even when I'm at home, the proper mental force is for us to realize that I am still connected to all other human beings. So what I do right now at home will still have an impact on the people around me. Therefore, if you indulge on your anger, right? Who are the first people to suffer? Your family, right? But nobody deserves to, uh, to, to, to become, you know, to, to, to become the receiving end of your anger because we're all in this together. And therefore, 
Freeing your action from anger, greed, or ignorance, freeing your thoughts and freeing your speech from all of this becomes one way for you to find paramita. And lastly, we are we come across consciousness, right? But consciousness it means all of the experiences stored in your mind as a memory that gets recorded and will influence your future actions. But consciousness also comes in as an awareness for you to actually see what it is that you are doing. Okay, what's influencing your action? What's taking effect on your decisions? And therefore, consciousness can also be translated as knowledge or full awareness of liberation. Okay, you have to know where you are. You have to know how you got there, and so by consciousness, it becomes an understanding that you have acquired through the constant contemplation of the previous four practices. For you now to finally realize, okay, I am extremely aware of how I got here, but most importantly, full awareness of liberation also needs to be applied to helping others. Okay. And so, in sum. When we talk about what we have talked about so far is a way to empty out the five skandhas is not to sever yourself from the world of reality, but it is actually a process of transformation. Okay. You transform the five skandhas of the human body into the five attribute attributes of the Buddha body by applying the right. Teaching to the phenomenon of reality, so that you turn things for the better. Okay. Make good use of every moment, because every chance, every crisis becomes a chance for you to turn things around. Therefore, we turn these five skandhas of the human body into the five attributes of the Buddha body by this table that you see. Okay, anytime you feel attached to a physical form or your physical body. Discipline your body mind so that it does not indulge on satisfying the desires of this physical body. And secondly, whenever you become confined to your feelings and concession sensations of good or bad, come back to meditative concentration when you contemplate deeply about the reality of matters that they're not real. And thirdly, you apply pranayam wisdom to perception so you can make. The proper decision to what you have come across. Okay, how should I react or respond to this? Fourthly, applying the proper mental forces only to lead yourself to freedom, not to lead yourself to greater shackles of desire. Finally, consciousness, which is the knowledge or awareness of liberation, is something that you need to maintain and. Ultimately, be able to share with others. A bodhisattva is someone who feels for others and is willing to share her skill with others. So both the self and other arrive at the other shore. This is how we come to the true meaning of paramita. I have about seven more minutes. Okay, we completed that first stage of severing our afflictions by applying the proper means to our. Experiences of reality, but this is not complete paramita. In order for us to complete the journey of Avalokiteshvara, you don't only see the emptiness of the self. This is another line that we can apply on the other side of seeing the five skandhas as empty. That is, we don't just see the self as empty. We don't see physical phenomena as empty. What you realize is any skill or knowledge you're holding on to is like a raft that helps you travel to the other shore. But the moment you travel to the other shore, you have to let go. So in the Pali texts, there's an instruction by the Buddha who tells you, "Okay, you must, with your own bare hands, collect the pieces of the Dharma, which are the branches or the leaves." In order for you to build the raft that will carry you across the river of samsara, 
So you imagine you're sitting there, you're in the boat. And then even when you're in the boat, you have to roll with your own hands in order to reach the far shore. So the symbol of rowing with your own hands means actual practice of the knowledge you have acquired. But the moment you arrive at the other shore, what you need to do, need to do is to go on to the shore, but leave the ship behind. Okay. You cannot carry this raft on your shoulders when you're finally on the land of liberation. So by saying there's no cognition, no attainment, and no non-attainment, because there is nothing essentially to be attained, the Bodhisattva is now talking about how to coexist with everything. Because only by coexisting with everything can you find true liberation. Therefore, after the five attributes of the, of the Buddha's body, which is something we need to cultivate in order to find the criteria of liberation, we also follow the three fundamental virtues of paramita. An arhat endeavors to sever his afflictions by emptying out all of these attachments. But what a bodhisattva does is not to sever the afflictions, but find a way to coexist with all of this without a sense of self and other. In other words, the bodhisattva no longer puts himself on opposite ends with all the living beings. That's what makes a bodhisattva virtuous. Okay? A bodhisattva is virtuous in three ways. First of all, the bodhisattva helps us see this by demonstration of the Dharma body. Okay. What is the Dharma body? Okay. Um, let's just say um, the Dharma body is like a spirit. Okay. The spirit of you or the spirit of the Buddha. But this spirit has no definite form. Okay. So what a Bodhisattva has with emotions or our experiences of reality is only to ask you, what kind of spirit do you want to show? How do you, what kind of image do you wish to create? Would you prefer someone to see you as a stubborn or ignorant person who acts on impulse? Or would you prefer to create an image of someone who is always calm, pleasant to be around, and who always makes the right decisions to remedy the situation? Whatever image that you wish to create, you have to actually take action in order to create that image under the guidance of proper knowledge. So in order to find liberation on the Bodhisattva side, right, the paramita first, how do we demonstrate our true spirit? The spirit of joy, the spirit of compassion, or the spirit of wisdom. And secondly, the bodhisattva virtue of paramita is actually called pranya wisdom. As said before, an arhat aims to sever affliction, but a bodhisattva aims to harmonize affliction and wisdom. In other words, how do you put ignorance and enlightenment on the same side? It really is up to how you make use of your knowledge. Knowledge is what you gain through the use of your six sensory organs. They come into your brain. But any knowledge that stays in the brain is not extremely practical until this knowledge, knowledge goes into your heart. When you feel or sense the emotion of self and other through the application of that knowledge. I once visited this man who had two daughters. And so on that day, um, I wanted to give a gift to this man's daughters. So what I had were two little accessories that look like Hello Kitty. One is orange, the other is red. So I passed it to the man, I said, okay, these are for your daughters. And then the elder daughter comes in, right, sees the two accessories, grabs the red one and said, hey, I like this red one. And then what the man told his daughter was, okay, now 
Before you take the red Hello Kitty, I would like you to do one thing. Okay? Bring both of them to your little sister and ask her which one would she like. But as you ask which one would she like, the orange or the red, right? Fix your gaze on the orange one. Okay. So what happens is he wanted the elder daughter to show a sign to her little sister that she too likes the orange. So immediately when the little girl saw that her elder sister was looking at the orange, she took it as the better one. So she grabbed the orange Hello Kitty, runs off giggling all happy, while the elder daughter was very happy and satisfied with her red Hello Kitty. And so by this, we see the display of perennial wisdom in the men to make sure that both girls were happy. Right? Instead of lecturing the girls and say, hey, you know, respect each other's decision, you take what you take. And of course, the outcome will be very different. And so in this, we see that prana wisdom also entails your spirit of kindness and wisdom that will be passed down beyond space and beyond time. And so that's why we see Venerable Master Xing Yun's spirit uh, passes through all five continents. But the question is, how do we sense his spirit even though we don't see him? Okay. I just wanna see, show a quick picture of Venerable Master Xing Yun. We don't see him, but whenever we see Venerable Master Xing Yun's image or name, right? It somehow brings a smile to our face, doesn't it? We miss his compassion. We respect his wisdom, okay? And, but what he does is, although he doesn't have to be there, his greatest ability of showing his Dharma body as well as his prana wisdom is to be there with us without being there. That is, only to share his knowledge and compassion. And so that even though we don't see him, we sense his presence. Okay. We all know that he suffered from a major stroke a few years ago. Okay. And even during his recovery, we could sense his presence because he's always thinking about everybody. And the way he shows his presence is to show his care to everybody. Say, for example, on, uh, on the first day of April, one of the abbesses sent back 500 boxes of Godiva ice cream to Venerable Master, right? She said, okay, Venerable Master, this is our gift for you, you know, to show that we miss you. And, but Venerable Master Xing Yun was diabetic. He's still diabetic, so he doesn't take sugar. And immediately he says, okay, you know, shh, share this ice cream with everybody in the dining hall today. And so on that day, although we went through the formal silent meal, but it truly brought a smile to all of our faces when we saw that box of ice cream, because it helps us realize that Venerable Master is thinking of us. He still cares about us and he's still doing anything he can with his ailing body to be a part of us. He still wants to do something. So you would imagine when a 93 year old man who is already blind, confined to a wheelchair, losing his hearing, he's still able to make everybody happy every moment. Okay? That becomes his ability and his virtue to create a chance of liberation to all of us. So coming back to the third virtue of the Bodhisattva. Right? The third Bodhisattva uh, virtue of a Bodhisattva to help us acquire Paramita, right? Is that idea of liberation. Where he says, okay, my liberation is your liberation. Okay? In any moment when I think about how to help you, I help myself too. So we too can think about what we can do at this moment this very special time of the year, although we're not medical professionals, right? although we cannot do much, but even the little or the smallest acts we can take to help others will make a difference. So when you organize this, uh, the talk, the series of Dharma talks, right? I would say, I'm very grateful to you and 
I have so much hope in all of you in the fact that this small cost will grow into a great effect in the future because you never know. Whoever comes across this talk may find a way to lead themselves out of their despair. And so never give up on your ability to paramita, okay? Because any moment you keep trying, right? You move closer to the goal. Okay. And so to sum up my talk for today, I just wanted to show some kind of guideline in the Heart Sutra to help us empty ourselves from our attachment to the five skandhas, but at the same time, make amazing use of the Dharma to transform our affliction into compassion and wisdom. And last but not least, when Avalokiteshvara as a Bodhisattva, having crossed over to the other shore, is willing to come back and to experience reality with us again, only to show us a way to liberation. It is the three types of virtues that she or she encourage, encourages us to really attain so that in the future, we may also do the same. So I hope these five aspects of the Buddha body, which you apply as a remedy to the five skandhas and the three virtues that will help you eventually accomplish paramita could serve as a wonderful practical guideline for you in the future. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Venerable Niao Guang, for your very inspiring talk. It's our honor that we have this opportunity to listen to your guidance and applying your teaching to our daily life. So for the Q&A session, I welcome everyone to type the question either on YouTube or Zoom, and I will redirect the question to Venerable Niao Guang. So our first question is, uh, changes are dukkha. How do we embrace changes that happened to our life during COVID-19 pandemic so we can have a svara and be at peace with ourselves? Uh, so the question is, how do we embrace change? Okay. Yes. So first of all, by embracing change, that's understanding that change is eventual. Change has always been happening. Change is always around us. And therefore there's no need to, uh, to, 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 to face change as a suddenly arising incident. It's like the question of asking you, do you realize you're breathing now? What actually helps us realize we're breathing? It's the moment when we are deprived of our ability to breathe. We begin to realize the importance of breathing. Okay. So in COVID-19, right, this amazing experience, many are instructed to put on a mask and maintain social distance. Okay. We see this as change, but instead of calling it a change, what about calling it a wake up call for us to take another good look at what is happening to us. Okay. So, well, how do we embrace change? First of all, don't see it as something that's alien, right? It's a natural part of us that is happening every day, but we tend to hold on to what we think is the normal and refuse to turn our face towards what is actually happening to us that is regarded to change. Okay. So in this moment, I would ask you to uh, be mindful of a couple of things. Okay. First of all, can you be grateful to the change that is happening to you by thinking, hey, this is an opportunity for us to turn a new page. So when all human beings are asked to stay at home, okay, you discover that air has cleared up water becomes cleaner and the ozone layer has fixed itself. Although we don't enjoy or appreciate the change that comes in the form of loss of freedom, how about looking at this as a whole picture and see the good things that are also happening? 
So there are always two sides to the same coin. Whenever you see dukkha, remember joy is on the other side. And whenever you enjoy your satisfaction or your fulfilled desire, remember that you need to be ready to deal with the dukkha that will follow. Okay, so there's really no change because we are always changing. Okay, it's just like when you're breathing. So appreciate it, right? And take a good opportunity to take a different action to see how can I respond to this differently in order to make a better change. Okay, I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Venerable Melkong. Um, the next question is, you mentioned concepts of MT2 and the best way to learn is to first unlearn. So how do we open our mind with compassion? Okay, how do we open our mind with compassion? Okay, this is really the question of how do we come to the sense of no self, right? And so the question of how do we maintain a sense of no self? That is, we empty out our presence of ego. Okay? By empty out, it actually means to create space, doesn't it? When we empty a sense of self, we create space for anything other than self. When we empty out our ego, it actually means we are actually creating more space for other people to be present with us. So I no longer focus on just myself. Okay. Compassion is twofold, right? When you establish that space so others can also be in your presence, you start to think about two things. If I always think of others, if I'm always considerate of others' feelings next to myself, right? I realize I'm going to treat them as I treat myself. First of all, I don't want suffering. And so if you don't, I don't want suffering, I will not inflict suffering onto others too. I will alleviate their suffering. And secondly, having done so, we would strive to also bring joy to others as we want to do so for others. And so what is compassion really? Okay. And what is wisdom? Right. Avalokiteshvara is known to possess both compassion and wisdom. Therefore, when you ask which come first, okay, we really don't know. But when we ask this question to Dr. Lancaster, emeritus professor from UC Berkeley, he says, I really don't know what it is like to attain pranaya paramita. Yeah, I don't know what wisdom is like, but the only thing I know is that wisdom will never come to me if I never have a sense of compassion because wisdom is a means for us to achieve the goal of liberation. But without bearing in mind the kindness and the suffering of other people, we will never be motivated to make proper use of the knowledge. So this is a threefold relationship between wisdom, compassion, and liberation, okay? Compassion comes first because it will motivate you to take action. But wisdom comes in as the proper means for you to take meaningful action in order to help yourself and others. So without leaving a space for others to be in your presence, always bearing in mind of others, we will never give rise to compassion. Okay, so this will be my answer. Thank you, Venbo Miaoguang. Um, and the next question is, when we face the challenges of serious sickness, how do we use Heart Sutra to resolve suffering? Well, just chanting the Heart Sutra will not heal your illness. That's one thing. Okay. But in that case, then why do we chant the Heart Sutra when we feel pain and fear? Okay. This comes to the fulfillment of our desire to feel safe and to have shelter. Right? And so as said in the beginning, right, there are quite a few reasons to why we chant the Heart Sutra. 
But one of the most important reasons is that we believe that in chanting and repeating the words of enlightenment that has been handed down by bodhisattvas or Buddhas, we somehow will also become empowered by their wisdom and compassion. How does this work? It, empowerment means we feel the presence of others' dharma body. Okay, so as you think of Venerable Master Xingyun when you are lost and afraid, okay, somehow you feel calmer because you see him as somebody who has suffered so much. He has suffered war. He has suffered poverty. He has suffered illness. He never went to school. He cannot sing properly, right? He says he writes terrible calligraphy. But look at how far he, how long he has come. If someone like him who has gone through so much can still enjoy peace, right? What reason is there for us who are healthier, who are better, better provided for, who have greater op opportunities not to also find peace? And so as you think of this, you become empowered by the resilience and uh, the, the wisdom of Venerable Master Xing Yun. So too, in the same way as you chant the Heart Sutra, right? when you talk about no eye, ear, nose, tongue, or body, right? it's merely telling you that your physical experience does not represent the whole you. There's so much more than that. And once we see beyond it, right, we somehow find that courage like King Sibi, or we find the strength like Mother Teresa who gives up all her own well-being just so she can cradle someone who is suffering from leprosy in her own arms so that she can cling the body of someone who has boils and sores all over his body with pus and blood coming through. So she finds the strength in believing that if I just clean this body, he or she will be in less pain. So this is the moment when you become empowered by the heart sutra, so you rise beyond your own self benefits. Um, I've been talking about um, the book called The Second Mountain by David Brooks lately. Okay. It's quite an interesting journey because if you know David Brooks as a motivational speaker, in all of his previous works, right, the key to success, it's always about self-definition. It's always about self-achievement and self-success. But suddenly in his second mountain, he says, okay, I now see serious problem in seeing individual achievement or individual satisfaction as something that is separate from the world. It becomes real trouble when you place your own well-being aside from that of others. Because any moment you fail to use your own personal knowledge and virtue to also help others succeed, right? You haven't really accomplished anything. So the first mountain is about self-definition, self-success, self-identity. It could take you 40 years to climb that mountain. But when you finally arrive at the peak of that first mountain, you suddenly see that second mountain. And the second mountain is kindness, compassion, to be of service, right? To have consideration towards the pain and suffering of others. And having climbed that second mountain, you realize that you feel greater self-fulfillment. Okay. And so in chanting the Heart Sutra, although it does not help you overcome your illness, physical illness. But having been empowered by that wisdom and compassion, you will eventually rise above self-interest and discover greater ways to transcend all of this. And so I would say, yes, keep chanting the Heart Sutra because it's a sutra, it's a mantra of affirmation, right? The more you say it, the more you internalize it, the closer you are connected with this great insight of Avalokiteshvara who feels and sees that we are all one. If you're suffering, I cannot be well. If you're not enlightened, I can never be enlightened because we are all one. 
Thank you. Okay, the next question is, the Ha Sutra explain, explains the fundamental emptiness, sunyata, of all phenomena. How do we explain emptiness to a child? Okay. It's easy. <laughs> you ask a child, do you love mommy? Right? What would your child say? say of course I love you, mom. Right? And then you can ask, okay, show me that love. Right? And most likely your baby, right? Your baby girl, baby boy will come, you know, like dive into your arms and give you like the sweetest and the biggest hug. And you tell her that's love, right? But the next time you come to me in tears, I know you're also showing your love to me because you trust me, right? So love has no one face. Everything can be love. That's my answer. That's a great answer. Thank you. Okay, then the next question is for laity. What's your advice for them to practice no form, no sensation, no discrimination, no conditioning, and no awareness? Okay. The word no, 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 right? It doesn't really mean that nothing is there, right? The word no in the Sanskrit text of the Heart Sutra comes in as ah which is a negation, right? A negation of a true nature. So when we say no, <clears throat> it's been translated into Chinese as wu, right? So that's, quite of, that's, that's why we're quite often, you know, we'll misconceive the idea of no as nothing. But the true word of negation is actually for us to realize that what we see in front of us lack something. <clears throat> for example, when I see you smile, right? But I can say, right? Your smile lacks some kind of intention, right? It's not there, but I can sense it, right? So what is it about the phenomena that you can sense has something missing? Okay, I see water, right? Okay, then I say, okay, there's no I, but simply it only means uh, there's no such thing called I because it lacks this true, eternal, unchanging nature. By I, we're not talking about the eyeball. By I, we're actually also talking about your nerves, right? Your pupils and everything that constructs your ability to see the reflection of light and the formation of shapes, okay? So it lacks a true nature, okay? And so what... What happens when I say, look with your eyes? Okay. But you're not really looking at looking with the eyeballs, are you? You're looking at something with your nerves, your pupils that deflect light, but all of these images then become sent to your brain. So by eye, no eye, no ear, no tongue, right? Don't look at form just as form. Don't listen to sound, just a sound, right? See the truth in form. Otherwise you'll merely be turning a blind eye to a smile that has tears, right? If you only rely on your eyes to see that smile, to come to a decision that the person is happy, right? You forget that you also need to look with your heart to feel the emotion of this person in front of you. And so again, what we're trying to say is, don't just trust in your eyes, trust in your heart. In the mind that sees a bit more, trust in your heart, in a heart that feels more. And then you are able to really connect with reality as a sentient being, right? We are all sentient beings. We all hope to be recognized, to be understood and to be accepted with emotion. And therefore, when the Heart Sutra says there's no eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, it means this is not my only eye, 
right? In the dark, how do I find my way to a switch? I use my hand, right? And then in silence, how do I find my direction to my baby, right? I listen to the sounds of her movement. So your ears can be your heart, your ears can be your eyes, your hands can be your eyes. When you don't see the six sensory organs as individual faculties, when you use all six as one, you're going to see, you're going to sense, you're going to understand, and you're going to feel so much more. Okay? So feel with your heart. Your heart is your eye. Thank you. The, uh, we only have time for one last question. So the last question is, what is the single most important action attitude you can recommend us? And how can we apply Heart Sutra to help us achieve the goal? Okay. The most important action I will recommend. Okay. Um, let's go back to the Buddha's light verse. And let's only look at the last line. Okay. What is the last line? May we, may our humility and gratitude give rise to great vows. So this is the last line of the Bliya verse, but it's the first step to cultivating ourselves. And in the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara says, you need to see that the five skandhas are empty. That means let's apply our humility to realize, oh, I never realized I have been so attached. I never realized I have been so ignorant. I never realized I have been so greedy. Okay. But this is not to tell us that we must stop being greedy because as human beings, we'll always have desire, right? As sentient beings, we'll always be ignorant. But humility gives us a greater capacity to embrace the lesser half of ourselves. Right? When we learn Buddhism, right, we usually set out with the conception that we want to be a perfect person. But ultimately, at the end of the road, you realize what you achieve is actually your ability to embrace the dark side of you in order to show that brighter side of you. So I would say, stay humble. You know, always think of humility in your daily reflections, especially at the end of the day. Right? Think back to what you have done. If there's something that was not good, something that you have done wrong, instead of blaming, how about is say, hey, you know, um, I, I need to be humbled and I feel shameful for what I have not done well, but I can be better. Okay, so have humility. And secondly, have gratitude towards those who have stayed by our side when we have been these imperfect or ignorant human beings. Because all of us are, right? We cannot strive to set out to be enlightened Buddhas immediately. But along this path, there is our family, our teachers, and our mentors and friends who are willing to accept us for who we are. So be grateful for those who have not given up on us. Be grateful for those who are willing to accept us for who we are. And you will see that with humility and gratitude working alongside, you somehow find the strength to want to start to be better, right? To start the journey of paramita. That is when you give rise to vows. So every day, I really, really pay attention to how I chant the Buddha's light verse. He says, my kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity pervade all worlds. May we cherish and build affinities to benefit all beings. May chant, pure land, and precepts inspire equality and patience. May our humility and gratitude give rise to great vows. So in the Heart Sutra, to realize that we are lesser than who we think we are in the sense of physical form, right? But we are so much more once we relinquish attachments to who we think we are and pay more attention to the rest of the world. And you realize your world will start to change, not because it changes, but because you change as a more humble and a more grateful person. So be grateful for the wisdom, but be humble for who you are not yet to be. Okay, thank you. 
Venerable Mel Guang, for your guidance and your wisdom. Uh, we really appreciate your time and eff uh, effort in answering all those questions. I will now invite the president of BRIA Boston chapter, uh, Guo Liang Na, for a closing re remarks. Please, President uh, Guo Liang. Okay. So, auspicious greeting to Venerable Miao Guang, Venerable Jue Qian, uh, BLIA Boston chapter members, um, friends, devotees. Um, once again, we are very delighted, happy, and honored to have Venerable Miao Guang um, joining us tonight to give the public talk to our members, devotees, friends, um, perhaps from not just from US, Taiwan, but from all around the world. Um, I would like to uh, thank, also thank our advising uh, Venerable Venerable Jue uh, Qian, who is helping us um, organize this event. I know it has been uh, not an easy task for her, uh, not just for us, but for her as well. And um, also um, through this talk, I'm sure that not just me, but all, we all understand, we can um, have, have obtained a lot of uh, inspiration and a better understanding of the five scandals, they are, which are empty. And they are also the teaching of the true uh, reality, which by that, we know all should know how to use Heart Sutra to reduce our own suffering and perhaps to reduce the suffering from our friend and all ascension being that we can help. On behalf of uh, BLIA Boston chapter, I actually would like to take this opportunity uh, to present the offering from our members and devotees to Venerable Miao Guang as a token of honorable and appreciation. So Venerable Miao Guang, please accept our sincere offering. Um, we will... Thank you very much. Your, your kindness and thoughts are well received. And I wish you every peace and good health during this very special time. May you be safe and well. Thank you very much, Miao uh, Guang. We will hand over the offering uh, to Venerable Jue Qian. She will then uh, I'll give it to you uh, and next time she meet you in place. <laughs> so um, with that said, um, that uh, conclude my uh, my thank you note to Enro Miao Guang. And let's pass the microphone back to our MC, Su Zhen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you President. Much. Thank you, Miao Guang Fasi. Thank you, President Guo Liang. Before we adjourn, I would like to announce the detail of our next Dharma talk. So the next Mandarin public talk is on July 26, and the title is Chen Buddhism, the 10 Oxfording Paintings by Venerable Manchian. Uh, let me share. Okay, and that wraps up our event. Thanks again for making the time in your busy schedule to join us. It's been our pleasure to host this event and we hope you and your family are staying healthy and safe. See you at the next talk. Thank you. Thank you.